Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. I hope, uh, despite brief, uh, you enjoyed a refreshing uh, tea and coffee break. Um, it's uh, now my pleasure to uh, introduce the second track of this morning's event and to introduce uh, the track chair, uh, Professor Mahmoud al Qutairi, who is Associate Dean for Graduate Studies at Khalifa University. If you would please join me in welcoming uh, Professor al Qutairi. Thank you, Dr. Wes, and uh, welcome everybody. The bell is sounding. It's uh, encouraging people to come back. Um, well, we have uh, another um, interesting session ahead of us uh, on smart education in a localized context. And we've got uh, two distinguished speakers uh, for this session. We've got uh, Professor Chi Ki Lui and uh, Dr. Abdel Latif Shamsi. We'll start off with uh, Professor Chi Ki Lui. Uh, he's a professor of education in the Learning Sciences and Technologies Academic Group and the Office of Education Research at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Uh, he was the founding head of the Learning Sciences Lab, uh, the first research, which is the first research center devoted to the study of the sciences of learning in the Asia-Pacific region from 2004 to 2008. Uh, his research uh, on seamless and mobile learning has contributed significantly towards creating a model of one-to-one -one computing um, in the School of Computing at his institution. And he's currently the head of the Center for Scalability, Translation, and Commercialization of the National Institute of Education in Singapore. Uh, please, well, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Chi Li Ku to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So it's still 11 something, so a uh, very good morning to all of you. By the time I finish this talk, it's uh, afternoon. So uh, I come from the National Institute of Education. Uh, we train all the teachers in Singapore. Uh, which is, this is part of the Nanyang Technological University. Uh, I, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak to you at this symposium. So it's my honor to be here. So. Uh, So I thought it's appropriate. Singapore is a very small country, a city-state. Uh, just to let you know where Singapore is, in case you don't know. <laughs> so this is the map of the world. And I guess you know where China is. Eh? So there's uh, China. <laughs> and you move down, and you move down to Southeast Asia. <laughs> and then in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, the city-state of uh, Singapore. <laughs> okay. Uh, not too far from here, seven hours flight. Uh, so Singapore city is about 50 years old, and uh, its educational system is generally recognized for its uh, standard and its rigor. And in international t uh, tests like PISA and TIMS, uh, Singapore students typically perform well at the top of the pack. So uh, this is PISA, OECD PISA 2009, so the ranking for reading, mathematics, and science. So you can see uh, Singapore there. So I was told that uh, PISA, PISA 2012 results will be re released uh, next week. So <laughs> we await the, uh, the ranking for PISA 201, uh, 2012. Okay, so uh, this is the outline of my talk. Uh, the organizers asked me to say something that's of interest to policymakers something of interest to practitioners, and hopefully something of interest to industry partners and uh, researchers. So there's a tall order. I'll try to actually say something that might be relevant to you. So I'd like to talk at uh, reforms initiatives from uh, different levels of the education system. And I'd like to share with you an example of an innovation uh, 
at the systemic level, at the national level in Singapore, which is our ICT master plan in education. Uh, and addressing something that may be of interest, you are a teacher, I'd like to talk about a bottom-up innovation, uh, which is on uh, collaborative learning, bring collaborative learning to the classroom. And lastly, I'd like to introduce to you a report uh, done by the European Commission on upscaling educational innovations. And lastly, to share some thoughts and reflections on uh, conditions and uh, strategies for uh, success in taking innovations uh, to a bigger scale. So the motivation I come from is, I'm a, I'm a professor, I'm a researcher, so the motivation it comes from is uh, there's a huge gap between what we have in educational research and what we have in terms of the impact on practice and the impact on informing policy makers. So there's a lot of educational research published, but by and large they have not uh, made a broad or lasting impact on uh, mainstream uh, K to 12 primary secondary education. So, uh, so that's the motivation where I come from. Uh, so I'm not just interested in research, or let's say a research, or research that results in publications. How to take research to a point where they can be sustained, they can inform uh, policy, or they can lead to more useful practices in the classroom. So the, the speaker just now, I think it's not here, he gave you a pop quiz, uh, but so it is my pop quiz to you, uh, just borrowing a reader from Michael Fullen. Uh, you read the reader there? So four frogs are sitting on a log and one decides to jump off. How many frogs are left? Maybe someone can shout to me one or two answers. <laughs> huh? Huh? Zero. Zero. Okay. Zero. I'll come back to this reader at the end of my talk. <laughs> okay. So uh, addiction reforms, uh, it happen at different levels. So as policymaker, you, you look at uh, setting policy at the macro level. I mean, you heard from the first speaker on the plans for smart education. So macro level, the policymakers, and they look at educational policies and providing the infrastructure, framework, and support mechanisms. So you see it at the top of the pyramid. At, at the end of the pyramid, you have the practitioners, the people who are actually at the ground trying to implement these policies. So they implement it, they interpret it, and they adapt it. So most often, the, the challenge is the gap between the intent of the policy, the imperatives, and how they're interpreted at the ground. I think that, that's a big challenge uh, to education reforms. So what I'm saying is, uh, so there's a big challenge, there's a gap between what happens at the macro level where you know, the typical mindset might be, I, we decide on a policy and uh, we have the mechanisms to make it work. So there's a kind of a structural determinism at work, thinking that uh, you know, once you have a policy in place, it might be rolled down and be implemented at a broad scale. But on the other hand, at the micro level, when it comes to implementation, you know, once the teacher closes the classroom door, the teacher becomes a policymaker in, in her own right. So there's a lot of organic kinds of adaptations and responses. There may be resistance, and you adapt the innovation in ways which are quite different from the intent of the policymakers. So that is the challenge which I like to frame. And I say that there's a role for meso-level actors in the form of uh, university researchers, in the form of school leaders, and even in the form of industry partners who can broadly take this uh, policy imperatives, interpret it, concretize it, operationalize it in ways that the practitioner can understand, can experiment with, and can adapt. So, uh, so these meso-level uh, actors, they work at the interpretation policies, they develop workable models. You know, you, you talk a lot about one laptop per child uh, policy. So many countries are doing that, but how do you actually make that to work at the <coughs> At a level you can realize it. So this, you need the macro level actors, and you also need, uh, you know, how to make an uh, initiative or reform sustainable. You need evidence to show that uh, the initiative, the reforms work. So you do evaluation, you do collect research. So you say evidence-based, evidence-based uh, policies are more likely to be sustained because there's evidence to support. 
uh, support it and to sustain it. For most often, policymakers, they involve researchers at a later stage of this. So they could come, researchers come in and do the evaluation. So another, another position is researchers can come in right at the beginning to work with policymakers to do what we, we in the learning sciences field call design-based research, to co-design models together with the researchers. So, uh, so in short, this diagram shows that there's a role for this meso level interpreters. Industry, for example, industry that involved in PPP, public-private partnership, to try to, you know, to try to take this to the ground level and work with them, providing the technology, providing the support, and trying to make it sustain. So, uh, so that's my sense of the, the, the broad problem we're looking at. Uh, the, the gap between the intent of policymakers and what actually happens at the ground. So uh, it's always, often quite surprising for policymakers to see what actually happens in the classroom. On the other hand, classroom teachers do not quite understand what, uh, you know, very broad, weightly kind of form, kind of uh, uh, initiatives, learning outcomes at the macro level. So now I'll come back to Singapore and share an example of a country a nation seeking systemic reform in the integrated use of ICT in the schools. So it's a journey that has taken a long time. We started way back in 1997. Uh, and for Singapore, it's about uh, human capital development because we have no natural resources. So developing human capital is a key national focus. And because of this, we align policies regarding education, to manpower and economic development. So a lot of it is about manpower development, preparing students for jobs for the economy, uh, especially in the early years. Of, uh, and uh, ICT becomes important because ICT is a way to prepare them for the knowledge-based economy. And ICT is a way to help them enhance the learning experiences. So uh, we have three master plans for ICT in education. Uh, starting way back in 1997. So uh, we look at it in terms of master plan one, two, and three. So there are phases that we go through. The first phase was really, really building the foundation, providing the infrastructure, equipping the com schools with computers, and training teachers on basic use of ICT. So it's really uh, building the foundation. The second one is uh, seeding innovation, to seed innovation in schools. So schools, they're more ready can innovate and they can apply for resources, support to uh, uh, develop, to see this innovation. So you can see pockets of innovation happening in the second master plan. Now the third master plan, which is the current master plan ongoing, is how to strengthen the successful innovations and how to spread it to benefit more schools. So that's a challenge now, how to strengthen and scale uh, innovations that work in schools that are experimented. So it's a journey. Uh, so back to Master Plan 1, we provide core ICT training for all teachers, uh, ICT infrastructure and support, and educational resources for the different school subjects. And the uh, outcome of this is uh, teachers start to accept ICT as a tool for teaching and learning. Second Master Plan, CD innovation. So Singapore has about 360 schools. The idea is to equip the schools that are most ready with all the resources so they can forge ahead to develop pedagogies enabled by ICT. So those we call the future schools, FS, and the lead ICT schools. So the model is if these schools develop good models, they can percolate, they can percolate and spread the practices to further schools down, down the, the, the chain. So as some examples of ICT use in uh, schools uh, in different areas in the second master plan. We just have a glance at this. Okay. And the future schools are schools that uh, provide resources to, to uh, develop innovations in new ways of teaching and learning uh, using ICT, using IDM, interactive digital media, and working with industry to hopefully to have some of this sustain, and working with researchers to do R&D to develop understanding and depth, how to learn how to learn uh, the subjects deeply, how to, link, how to learn uh, higher level thinking skills in a 
more engaged way. And the third master plan is about strengthening and scaling. So the overall outcome is about based on the curriculum 2015. So ICT is not just by itself, it's to support the overall national outcomes intended for students. To be a confident person, a concerned citizen, a self-directed learner, an active contributor. So the a goal for this MP3 master plan three was explicitly on two, two things. One, self-directed learning. For students to have own management of their own learning, to have self-directedness, and students to be co good collaborative learners, to learn in collaborative ways with each other. So two very specific focus for MP3. And uh, of course, there are many areas you can focus on, but we choose to focus on these two areas so that we are clear focus, you know, you don't have too many other goals like, uh, like some of these goals that you read here. So, uh, and we, we try to try to achieve what these two fo fo focus allow us to do. Okay. And to achieve this uh, strengthening and scaling, we have a framework of uh, professional development. Uh, we develop uh, ICT PD framework. The idea of ICT mentors, so uh, teachers are more adept, uh, who, are more, who are more expert in the use ICT in schools, to be attached to schools to guide teachers to use ICT, and for the Ministry of Education to provide consulting and support for schools who wants to innovate, experiment, and recognition programs for teachers. Okay, so uh, like the first speaker said, a key piece of the a key piece of the systemic reform is really about the professional development, uh, providing all the support structures for teachers to use ICT in a classroom. So uh, what are some of the lessons learned? The first one is uh, the, the gap between having teachers to be ICT competent and having teachers to be good pedago pedagogues, to be able to use uh, ICT for uh, good pedagogy. So the, the challenge was evident in the early years when teachers were not very ICT competent. Uh, so there's a challenge between you know, teaching I, ICT technical skills, teaching ICT enabled pedagogies. It's a challenge we face in National Institute of Education. We train teachers. Some teachers come to our class and say, we like to be trained in the use of ICT tools. But we tell them, no, that's not what we want to do. We want to teach you how to use ICT for teaching and learning. The second one is uh, between uh, centralization and autonomy. So Singapore is a small city state. Uh, most of the schools are, uh, all the schools are under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Education. How do we balance between centralization and providing bottom-up autonomy from the schools? So, uh, so through this master plan, I mean, it's a journey we took, and we went through different kinds of transformation. So uh, you can see in terms of curriculum assessment, professional development, research and development, and infrastructure for learning. Maybe just spend a, a few seconds to look at this. So look at professional development. So pro first master plan, provide core training for all teachers and school leaders. Second master plan, provide differentiated professional development and cons consultancy to school leaders. And the third one is to develop professional learning communities for teachers to learn from each other. And in terms of research and development, uh, the first master plan was to involve industry to spearhead R&D efforts. Second one is about seeding innovation. And third one is about translating research from what you know to classroom practices. So, uh, so in terms of strategies, how to make it work, uh, there's a tension between centralized and decentralized. There's a different strategies can use top down, bottom up. So uh, I'd like to uh, spend a few minutes to look at this. So centralized and decentralized are more outcome oriented, uh, purpose oriented. Top down and bottom up are more like methodology process oriented. So, uh, so think of, think of uh, strategies to help you realize your educational reforms initiatives. I like to put it into these uh, four quadrants. So centralized or decentralized, and top-down or bottom-up. Okay. So, uh, 
So centralized top-down scaling. So everything is from the top. The goals are set by the policy makers. And then strategies also implemented from the top. So like the, like the master plan tree, we define the focus as self-directed learning and collaborative learning. So this comes from the top. It's centralized and top-down. And then we have a lot of strategies to roll this out to the schools. We have the ICT mentors, the baseline ICT standards, and the future schools. So these are centralized top-down kind of uh, initiatives. And they have very high level of prescriptiveness. You know, and they have uh, different ways of disseminating from the headquarters through workshops, materials, resources, uh, H HQ staff as resources. So think of it as very top-down, uh, centralized. And then we also have uh, centralized bottom-up scaling. So the outcome, the goals are set from the top, but innovations are encouraged from the ground up. So schools are encouraged to put up initiatives for experimentation. So top, we have a tagline called top-down support for bottom-up innovations. So you know you want to go after interactive digital media for learning. So we set aside some funds and allow schools to, to submit proposals for funding. So you have a number of uh, projects, initiatives that comes from the ground based on the broad imperatives from the policy perspective. So this could be school-driven projects. And the school may decide to go in a certain direction, like uh, problem-based learning, or it could be research-driven kind of projects. Okay. And then, of course, there's, coming from industry, you might think of uh, decentralized bottom-up scaling. So agency is really from the ground. You try out things in one school and see whether it works. If it works, then you really ca catch on on its own. So these are, you know, you think of the, there are a lot of examples from the technology industry, like the iPad, iPhone, it catches on very much on its own. But education, you see, in, at least in my country, you do not see many of these examples. So, uh, but there's the role for decentralized portable scaling in implementing educational reforms. So that's, that's my broad uh, framework for looking at strategies for uh, implementing these uh, reforms initiatives. Okay, so uh, we share the master plan education. I'd like to make some, uh, like to make some uh, generalizations. So we spent this 15 over years. So what have we achieved? I think just now a question was asked about the effectiveness uh, in the, the first session. So it's a question of uh, looking at it at different levels as the, the speaker answered. So we see that cultural change has per permitted the school. So a uh, sense of readiness by Leaders, teachers, and students embrace and use ICT. Like 20 years ago, maybe some teachers do not see ICT as part of their repertoire of tools. So the floor is raised with regard to the integration of ICT in the curriculum. So it's all the schools are implementing it, but different levels of uh, implementation. That's okay. You know, you're more ready, you do more. You're less ready. You know, you can still, still, uh, you can still use it appropriately. And... Uh, Teachers have observed students start to learn in self-directed ways and to collaborate. Uh, but there's still problems. Uh, teachers still might associate collaborative learning with group learning. Just put these students together to get them to collaborate, but it's really just group learning. You know, a lot of more structures and uh, guidelines and scaffolding need to be put in place for students to really learn collaboratively. And, and why, why is it... Uh, more likely to be sustained. What are the developments, changes that take place? So we see a kind of distributed leadership. It's not just at the top level now. It's distributed at the different levels. You know, policy maker, the school leaders, the heads of departments. So collective decisions can be made at different levels. And this is, a, this is actually a factor for sustainability to, uh, to have distributed leadership. Uh, and a process where there's consultative dialogue uh, feedback, continuous feedback, and monitoring of what goes on. So uh, I think this is an important factor in trying, to, uh, in trying to monitor where you are in this process, to know that you're on the right track, you know, to find you, to have this dialogue, to know that what are the critical, non-negotiable aspects of the policy, and what are the aspects which might be adapted, localized for each school. I, I, I have described this in very abstract terms. I don't know whether you get it, but I, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
is a process of uh, a very discursive process of reflection, engaging stakeholders through dialogues, and uh, a continuous process of evaluation of implementation to identify gaps between what actually happens in the school versus the imperatives, the policy uh, level. And this, this process can be helped by uh, consult consultative feedback, by evidences collected by researchers, and, and, and planning together, working together to how to address these setbacks in, uh, in centralized scaling. Centralized scaling is everything planned from the top. So to, through this process, getting feedback from the ground and getting voices from the ground will help to complement the possible setbacks in uh, centralized scaling. Okay, so it's a, it's a consultative process. Uh, you know, you ask me how to explain you know, why we work the way we work. I think it's an inclusive, iterative, consultative, uh, consultative process of the different stakeholders uh, to, to, you know, to, to, to work together consultatively and, and, and plan the way forward. So that, 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 that is at a macro policy level. So I share with you the Singapore National Master Plan ICT Education and uh, try to reflect on the outcomes and the, some of the factors that explain uh, how it works. So now I want to move to the practitioner level. I want to move to uh, micro level and share with you what we actually do in a classroom. So I'm a researcher. I've been working with uh, teachers for the past uh, 10 years to share with you one particular innovation where we start with one school and we are able to move to many other schools. So it's, it's, it's about bringing collaborative learning to the Singapore classroom. So Singapore classroom a, a, has about 30 to 40 students in a class. So when the teacher talks, only one student can answer. So uh, how to encourage students to collaborate, contribute ideas, to work together, so these are some screenshots of uh, students working together in a classroom. And the technology enabled is very simple. You know you have a 3M sticky notes. So we have a digital version of that. And we work with the Stanford Research Institute initially. Uh, so look at this. Uh, they have a, the bottom plane is the private board. And the, the top plane is a public board. So, uh, so teacher teaching fractions in primary school asks, uh, think of fraction one over four. Can you think of all the possible ways you can represent this fraction? So every student will scribble on a digital note and put it in the public space. So they start to see what, what each other think of our fractions and using the ideas generated by the students to, to, uh, for, to, to, to lead the discussion in the classroom. So the, the teacher might classify the different ways of representing fractions they ask the students to sort the fractions in increasing order. And uh, in secondary school physics, you have a beaker of water with three holes. So how does the water flow out? Is it A or B? Any physics people here? Is it A or B? <laughs> so they can generate discussion. They see each other's ideas and generate discussion. OK, I I'll show you the video. On. So it's a classroom innovation, uh, trying to bring collaborative classroom, collaborative learning to the classroom.
Yes, we have about let's say either ten groups contributing or we have forty students contributing. But whereas in the class, um, sometimes we may not have that much of an opportunity. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And I think GS like what uh, like what we have is very real time uh, where they can uh, do and I can see. So it works in one school. So how do you take it to more schools? And what actually is it that you want to upscale? So upscale the practices of collaborative learning in the classroom. Uh, we want to upscale the principles of designing lessons that foster collaboration. Uh, we want to help teachers to know how to facilitate collaborative learning. And uh, we have a professional development model, which is principle-based rather than procedure-based. So these are good practices that we want to bring to more schools. And in doing so, we, we don't just spread. It's not just about quantity. It's also about greater depth. It's also about uh, 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 taking it from one subject to more subjects, one grade to more grades, one class to more classes, and one school to more schools. It's not just about this. It's also about helping teachers to adapt to co-design lessons based on uh, this way of uh, uh, in introducing collaborative learning in the classroom. So uh, this is a process that shows the, the journey we took. We started in way back in 2007, uh, and we developed some principles. And then we move on to more subjects, and, uh, and the, we iterate the principles. These principles are design principles for designing lessons. And then uh, we develop more pedagogical patterns, and we move on to more schools and, uh, and more schools. So the Ministry of Education helped us to introduce this to more schools. So the reason why I bring this up is to show that uh, many research innovations just stop in the schools. You know, if, how, how do you plan for sustainability? You must plan it right, uh, right from the beginning. You cannot assume that you, know, you develop something and try to, try to research some hypothesis. At the end, if it works, then you try to spread it. That usually doesn't work. You must start right at the beginning. So uh, the first speaker talked about interdependence, which I like very much. So my own metaphor is the wooden barrel, you know, to hold water you just, don't just rely on uh, one plank. Typically, we rely on a technology plank. But we also look at the other aspects of it, policies, pedagogy, 
uh, assessment, assessment practices, relationships between researchers at school and the, and the school practitioners, teachers' beliefs, you know, how to change teachers' beliefs. So uh, a very systemic effort in trying to work with teachers. So uh, we know a lot about improving teaching and learning, but we don't, do not know a lot about trying to engage in uh, taking this to uh, a wider audience. So we don't know enough about expanding, disseminating, assessing, and sustaining what we already know. So this is a challenge we face. And this is a, a, a proposition by Norris Sabelli of SRI to do more what you call implementation research, which, is, which is, can be partnership uh, between universities, schools, and policymakers to achieve long-term sustainable improvements in education. So, uh, so we do, you take initiatives to school, like research initiatives, or maybe industry working with schools. So there are many intervention studies, but they don't scale up. And then there are good intervention studies that look, look, lead to good scaling. And what we want is to achieve depth, uh, sustainability, and spread. And then we have good intervention, but the scaling becomes very bad. The implementation becomes, you know, you don't look after the inter interdependent factors, you upset people. You know, you don't, you, don't, you don't develop the leadership. And so if you, you, you miss the opportunity to exploit the potential of good in, implement, intervention. And then you're not so developed intervention, but you have good scaling, try to develop the capacity of the people you work with, you know, to help to, how to implement good pedagogy in the school. Uh, le less than five minutes. Right? Yeah, two minutes. Okay, okay so, so that's my sharing of a very bottom-up innovation. I start at the top, top of the macro level, and then I, I move down to the bottom, uh, move up, uh, bottom up innovation. So, uh, so in concluding, I'd like to share with you a study that I was uh, involved with. So there was a European Commission study that looks at a number of uh, upscaling projects in Europe and in Asia. So I contributed the case study of Singapore's uh, master plan tree in education. So you can assess this policy, policy report. So it's a website. And they develop a framework for looking at uh, innovations for upscaling, looking at the nature of the innovation, the implementation, assess the impact and the target. And then develop some, some tools for you to look at uh, your upscaling processes. So maybe more, what is more interest is the, the, the general findings. So the commonalities among the projects that are managed to upscale in Europe and in Asia, uh, you can read them. So they develop organically over time. It's an ecology model, allow things to grow, uh, provide the structures top down, but allow things to grow organically at the bottom up. So they follow top down strategies for supporting bottom up innovations. So, and I, so I, I like to say there's a role for industry researchers as meso level uh, actors in, in, in this process. And, and these projects provide architectures for self-organized learning across sites and levels. And they facilitate shared ownership for continuous innovation and sustainable change at many levels. They have leadership strategies. And it's multi-level system-wide. So you approach the problem at multi-levels. Okay, so, uh, so by implication, you can think about the roles of government, funding agencies, industry, researchers, and practitioners. Okay, so just, just to interest you in this report, if you're interested in issues of how to take uh, in, an innovation and upscale it, either for the policy makers in the perspective of uh, industry. So, uh, so in summary, uh, innovations happen at many different levels of the system. You know, they try to implement changes at the top, or they try to innovate at the bottom. And I share with you the National Innovation of Singapore, ICT in Education. Uh, and the key characteristics is uh, it's constantly monitoring, iterative, and consult consultative, trying to measure the gaps between the implementation and the intent, and try to address these gaps in a consultative uh, manner. And the bottom-up innovation I share with you, the example of collaborative learning in the classrooms, uh, is about going out to school to ad address the real needs of school. It's not taking something and bring to the classroom, but addressing real needs of school. And I share with you a study by EC on scale innovations, 
in the process, I, I share with you some of my thoughts and reflections on uh, conditions and strategies for uh, success. So back to this. <laughs> so some of you said none or three. So the answer is uh, four. So uh, you know, trying to get people to implement policies, deciding is not the same as doing. That's for Michael Fullen. Thank you.